we go. To petrol pet and welcome to a real driver's car welcome to the alpine a110 now i often get asked what's your channel about what kind of things do you like doing the most and clearly i'm a car channel and I love all kinds of cars. It doesn't matter to me what kind of drivetrain they have, whether they've got an internal combustion engine, a hybrid, or an electric car. But the cars that really get me going, the cars that I'm really interested in, are what I just classify as driver's cars. And the brief for that is a pretty wide one. And when I chose my Boxster, one of the things that made me interested in this car in the first place and make me love this car now during ownership is it's an out and out driver's car and that the alpine a110 that's definitely a driver's car and interestingly as soon as i put some social media pictures up on facebook and instagram of this car when it was delivered i had loads of messages saying compare it to your porsche you know would you get one of those why would you get an alpine instead of a porsche now I guess there's a couple of things we need to think about here. First off, if I was being absolutely fair, I'd be comparing like for like. I'd be comparing an Alpine A110 probably against a Cayman and not a Boxster because clearly this doesn't have a roof and this does. But I don't have a Cayman, so please forgive me. We'll make do with having a convertible versus a hardtop unless Alpine are really cool and chop the roof off of one of them because I think that would look really cool. So... I'm going to do a couple of things in this video. I mean, we could have a game of top trumps and it would be to start with, you think, well, the Porsche is going to absolutely wipe the floor with this one. Let's do power. 360 horsepower, near enough 250 horsepower. So loads more power. Ah, but what about weight? 1,400 kilos, which isn't bad compared with 1,100 kilos. There's 300 kilogram difference between that car and that car and that makes a big difference that makes that 250 horsepower suddenly seem far far more impressive they're both a similar format mid-engined dct or twin clutch gearbox both completely oriented around the driver let's take a look at the alpine first and then i want to do another comparison which actually for me is one of the really important ones that would probably impact whether i bought one of these or whether i bought one of these but I think the A110 is a pretty, pretty car. I've wanted to get my hands on one for a while. It's really small. I mean, it's a dinky little car and that gives it a lot of advantages, especially on the road. It's lightweight and it's small footprint means that you can just place it so easily. It's an absolute pleasure to drive down a B road and we'll get to the driving part very soon. The downsize of its size means that packaging is a real challenge. As soon as you wanna put two adults in here, and an engine and a gearbox and luggage then it might be a little bit of a challenge but certainly front end styling now the front end lights hark back to the original alpine and i like that because it shows some heritage in the car interestingly some comments on my social media there are some of you that aren't that fond of the front end of the car in terms of lighting i actually really like it if we just have a quick wander around the back the back's really pretty I mean, as I'm stood next to the car, you probably get a feel for just how small it is. You know, the roof line's barely at my waist. It's got a beautiful carbon fiber, exposed carbon fiber roof. But the rear end of the car, very sleek, very pretty. Now the A110S is maybe more my cup of tea because that's got a bit of a wing on the back. And I really like the look of that. It's got a completely flat underbody, which I'm gonna to struggle to show you, and a really nice diffuser, central exhaust. It's just a beautiful, beautiful thing to look at from any angle. And certainly while I've been driving it around, this car gets a lot of attention and lots of kind of people pointing at it. I don't think they're a particularly common car 
on the road still, where you could argue, you know, there's a lot of Porsche Boxsters and Caymans out there, maybe not so many A110s. Now, the test that I want to do is that when I first saw this car, this bit here, I thought this was just like a spoiler that came up when the car was going quickly like some cars. No, this is the boot aperture. So I'm now gonna do a very unscientific test, which may surprise you because it definitely surprised me. Because when I picked up this car, or got it delivered rather, and, and started to have a look around and opened up the luggage area, I instantly thought, that's, there's just no point in that car, there's no luggage, you're not gonna be doing anything in there in terms of road trips or going away for the weekend. Because one of the things I love most about this is, let's talk about packaging. I honestly don't know where the engine is in this car because there's a huge amount of luggage space and plenty of room for two big adults. So the next test is just how much luggage can I get in my Boxster? And then I'm gonna compare that with how much luggage I can get in the A110. Okay, time for a reasonably unscientific test, but one that's a good demonstration. So I've actually already put some luggage into the Boxster. The Boxster, these both have a front and a rear luggage compartment. In the Boxster, it's pretty big. So if we look in here, I've got two um, flight cases. This first blue one, this is the standard size that you would be allowed on a overhead luggage compartment on an aeroplane. And then this one is a little bit bigger, a bigger wheelie case. And actually, this boot space is so big, you could get other stuff packed around there. So I think that, that's front luggage. If we go around the back, in the back, I've got two bags. So I've got a squishy, flight bag, so this, um, it's actually got a rolled up rug in there just to give it a little bit of body and substance. And then I've also got a suit carrier, which fits quite nicely in there. And there's my suit carrier. And again, there's room in the back to put some other stuff around there. So that, and, and I went away in this car for 10 days with two people on my GT tours and we had ample, ample space. And that's not taking into account any possible space inside the cabin, although really in one of these, there isn't a great deal of space behind the seats. So let's have a look at the Alpine. So first off, to open the front aperture or frunk or fruit, whatever you're gonna call it, you've got a little thing there and then And this is much, much smaller. Now, at first glance, I didn't think this looked like it would be really any use at all. But interestingly, if you take one of these standard flight cases and put it in there, it pretty much fits exactly half. So I don't have two, sadly, but you could get one in there and one in there. So that's two small flight cases you're not gonna be able to get something of this size in there though, sadly. So you've got to pack light. Let's go around the back. It's a little bit more challenging. So if we just open up things, you just pop the little button under here, and this, this is the internal aperture. Now, there are some things in here. There's like a little tool kit, there's a safety triangle, there's your um, user manual, but then under each side here, there's some storage. It kind of goes into almost like the wing. But the problem is the aperture size. So I'm not gonna be able to get in the back there something like a suit carrier like this. It's just physically not gonna fit in the aperture. You might, however, get a squishy bag in the back, as long as you can kind of squish it down you might then be able to pack stuff around the corners and probably be able to close that. And I can come down here and I should be able to close that. So it's actually not nearly as bad as I thought it was gonna be. I literally thought you might get a hold all in there, but you can get two flight cases under the bonnet at the front 
and you can get squishy bags and softer things in the back. Big challenge though, if you are going to a track day, let's say, which I kind of went go-karting on Friday and I had my kit bag with my race suit and my helmet and so on, the only place that will fit is in the passenger footwell. There's no way of getting any race kit in the bonnet or the boot, which I think the likelihood of one of these being tracked is probably quite high. Here, no worries at all. I can easily get my race kit in the front boot. So that's the luggage test. Let's jump inside and have a look inside the cabin because it's quite special in there. Really interesting test that. I'd had this car a couple of days and driven it quite a bit and lots of people were saying, oh yeah, what do you think of the car? And, and honestly, my response was, it's a great car to drive, but so impractical, there's no luggage space. I can't see why you'd buy one because all you could have it for is a fun day Sunday car. And then I started to kind of work out that little test and it, I realized that actually it's got way more luggage space than it looks like it has. If we were to consider the Cayman, by the way, the Cayman has a kind of parcel shelf at the back. And you look at this and you think you have, but actually there's like a sealed area above the engine and there's no, you can't get into it. So you can't actually put anything there. It'd be quite handy if they allowed you to use that too, but sadly you can't. Another thing to very quickly mention is that rear boot does get quite warm. So you'd probably have to be careful about what you put in there. And there's a little bit of space behind the seats, especially if you have them sat forward. In here, let's start with the seats because I think they are spectacular looking things. Absolutely beautiful. Um, trimmed beautifully with this kind of diamond stitch work on the leather, Alcantara. I just think they look stunning. They're as, probably as close to a racing bucket seat as I've had in a road car, with the exception of maybe Porsche and McLaren have kind of similar seats and they, they just, they're just so supportive. You're sat here and you're not going anywhere. All I would say is I'm a relatively slim frame and these seats are quite tight. Um, how do I put this subtly? If you're a slightly larger frame, then you may well find that these seats are a little bit too tight. The other thing is they don't recline, they're fixed in this position. So if you had a, you know, a problems with your back or, or wanted some more lumbar support, then you're not gonna get that in these seats, but they look amazing. And what they do do is they sit you in this fantastic driving position. Lovely steering wheel with a little bit of a flat bottom on it. Lovely floating center console. The choice of materials in here is lovely. There's, there's leather with this contrast stitching. There's some satin carbon fiber work. I really love the um, body color on the doors. And then you've got these little trickleors all over the car. There's some on the doors. There's a kind of trickleor on the main uh, instrument display. There's one down the rear three quarter of the car, just to remind you you're in a French car. I quite like that. It's really cool. Um, the infotainment system's very familiar to me because I've been driving a Renault Akana as my long-termer for the last three months or so, and this is a Renault Group car, so very similar. You can pair your phone with Apple CarPlay and Android Auto. There's a little um, uh, sort of deck down there to put your phone and a couple of USB uh, connections there. So you've got all of the, the toys that you would want nice leather door pulls. It's just a really super place. A um, couple of little foibles. I, I washed the car this morning. You always learn lots of things about a car when you wash it. One of the things is you can't actually lift the windscreen wipers up while the boots clo while the bonnet's closed because they foul with the bonnet, which is just a, a bit weird. But anyway, it's done for aerodynamics, I guess. Let's very quickly talk spec and price, and then we'll go out for a drive, I promise. So these start on the road from just under £50,000, £49,905. As standard, they come with 17-inch um, 10 spoke alloys. This car has the optional 18 inch diamond cuts. I really like those. They're 936 pound option. And then there aren't a huge amount of options on this press car, but the rest of the options on this options list, honestly, for this kind of price, I'd expect them to be included. Floor mats, 110 quid. Aluminium pedals, I'd expect aluminium pedals on a car like this um, as part of the package, they're 120 quid. Front and rear parking sensors, I'd expect that on a 50 grand car, that's 660 quid. The little logo in the middle of the steering wheel, that, 78 quid for that. Um, and then the blue stitching, uh, which, which looks so good. I mean, it's only 90 pounds, but really? Well, I'd, just, I'd just chuck that in anyway. Um, servicing uh, every year or 12,000 miles, whichever comes first. Three year warranty up to 60,000 miles. Um, so this car that we're sat in as spec is 
and ninety-nine pounds, and I think that's a really interesting price point because I okay, compare it with my Porsche. My Porsche as an eighteen-month-old car was sixty-two thousand pounds, so that starts to make this car look like pretty good value. I'll leave it to you to have a think about what the residuals would be like if you're comparing this with a Porsche. Arguably, Porsche have some of the best residuals there are, so it's pretty tough game to go up against them. Um, but I guess the rarity and the, you know, the the kind of um, uh, limited numbers of these cars that there are out there currently will probably mean residuals aren't too bad. So let's go out driving. Now it's actually quite difficult to capture for me the essence of this car when you're driving. It's not about outright pace or noise or it's it's something else. It's this intangible feeling it gives you through the steering, through the gear change, through the the seat of your pants. It's just, yeah, it's the thing, the essence that makes a driver's car. And that's definitely what this is. Okay, finally out driving. So just behind me is a 1.8 litre four cylinder turbo. And that's producing 252 horsepower and 320 newton meters of torque. And as I said, if you look at those numbers on a piece of paper, you think it's not. I mean, my Mini produces more than that. My Mini's 270 horsepower, 400 newton meters of torque. However, this car is so light—1,100 kilos for a modern car—is remarkable, really. That is then driven through a seven-speed dual-clutch transmission, rear-wheel drive. And that's about it really in terms of power plant just under we're just mooching along at the moment the car has a a little it's almost like a background whistle and whine you can hear there's a couple of intakes literally just by this piece of glass here and you can kind of hear a bit of induction noise and under normal load it's not really too shouty and too poppy at the moment i'm in normal mode i'm in normal drive and it's a very relaxing place to be the suspension you would think would be super firm and focused and actually it's really not there's no adjustability in the suspension this road's awful in terms of tarmac but it soaks the bumps and the lumps up the one thing you do feel though is because the car's so light you can kind of feel it moving around and it's very darty on the on the steering and you just know that when you put it in sport mode and when you want to push on a little bit and you want to take that little 1.8 four pot up to its six and a half thousand rpm red line you just know something special is going to happen so okay at the moment i'm just in normal mode and i'm in d mooch mode however i'm going to push the sport button on the steering wheel the display changes slightly there's no change in engine note or or any real feeling but now let's just drops down now from seventh down into fourth and i've got a bit more response and now i can just start to make a bit more progress let's just start to try and explain what this car feels like down a road like this it's a very communicative car you get a lot of feedback through the steering I think just because the car's so light the car's constantly talking to you through the steering wheel it's not jittery it's not unpleasant it's just there's a bump there Pete there's a, a little bit of an undulation there let's just kind of move the car around you can feel it under your bum just everything's just just there it's just so right in this D mode in sport mode the gear changes are really slick if I just slow the car down it's going to change down through the gears itself then I can just accelerate I'm just gonna no severe kick down it kind of knew what I wanted to do the gear changes are super crisp and super sharp it's actually a really nice relaxing way to drive the car does try and get up into seventh or its highest gear as quickly as it can but actually if you were just wanting to push on a little bit down a, down a road and just go a little bit quicker let's see it's gone into that in seventh and if I want to accelerate a way out now that's just dropped down two gears to fifth 
So if you want to just have a little bit more of a, an exciting drive, really the paddles, the paddles is the way to go. Okay, so we're in sport. I'm now gonna push and hold the D button. I'm now in manual shift. I'm gonna knock it down a gear into third and you, you can start to just hear that induction noise. The gearbox is super slick. Down and up are just seamless. And then the car just springs to life on a nice bit of flowing road like this. It's just got this exceptional feel to it. Every now and again you can hear the turbo spooling up or the wastegate dumping. And, and it just gives you this fantastic visceral feeling. It's a really quick car down the B road though. So you're going to catch up traffic, you're going to end up hitting the speed limit quite quickly. But let's just go through this nice set of bends here and, and you can brake coming in, downshift into third and then just on the gas through the corner, little bit of a lift and then just place the car so easily. It's a playful car on the road. On the downshift you get these little pops coming out the back. You either get four or five, <laughs> I've been counting them. Honestly, it's a great car and uh, it comes down to this, this visceral feeling. It's not, it's not visceral in terms of raughty engine noise. It doesn't have the drama of a great V6 or a great V8. It, it doesn't really deliver on the engine noise stakes at all. But what it does, it, it does it in other ways. It's got delicious steering. It's got this lightweight, playful chassis it's got enough power to really push on and you know ultimately get you into trouble the gearbox is super slick on the way up and on the way down the gear changes are so crisp and so precise and it's just a car that you drive down a great bit of road like that you get to the end of it and you've got a big smile on your face and that that's what a driver's car has to do that's for me the essence of an ultimate driver's car. And you're probably sitting there thinking, well, all cars are driver's cars. You've got to drive them all, unless we're talking about autonomous vehicles. But, but no, you know, a great hot hatch or a great sports car, manual or flappy paddle, I don't mind. It's just that intangible feeling that you get once you've really got to grips with the car down a fantastic bit of road. final impressions of the little Alpine A110. Well, it kind of takes quite a lot of inspiration from great sports cars, lightweight sports cars, like a Lotus Exige or even something like an Alfa Romeo 4C. They are brilliant things, but they're quite hardcore. This is lightweight, small, and compact and sporty, but I wouldn't call it hardcore. It's actually quite a pleasant car to live with. It's beautifully appointed in here. I know I keep raving on about these seats, but they are really very special. But it's nicely finished and it just feels like a premium product. And it's managing to do that and still maintain a curb weight of only 1100 kilos, which let's face it, is just unbelievable. My challenge with the car isn't to do with that lightweightness and the, what it's like in here as a cabin. It's certainly not to do with the way that it drives. I just don't think that I personally could live with one of these long term. I think it would be quite a challenging car. I mean, you're not gonna get bored of that, are you? I think it would be quite a challenging car to live with as a daily. The boot space, it's ample for going away on a drive tour if you pack smartly, if you wanted to go away for the weekend, but you know, doing the shop or you know, just little things. I think the lack of boot space would probably wind you up after a while. But if you wanted a car that's just in the garage for special occasions or for a nice drive out of the weekend, this ticks a lot of boxes. Would I choose one over my Boxster? 
no, I wouldn't. I've always wanted a Porsche Boxster and, and I love my car to pieces and it just has elements that raise it over and above this car. Do I love the Alpine A110? Oh yeah, I mean, seriously, it surprised me. I knew it would be great to drive, but I just didn't think I'd get on with it. I love the car to pieces. I just couldn't, I can't picture myself owning one. I'd be tempted by the A110S, wing on the back, a little bit more power, just a little bit more focus. I think that would be quite something and I'd love to get my hands on one. But they're a really, really cracking little car. I'd love to know what you guys think of the Alpine A110, put it in the comments below. But I hope you enjoyed this one. I wanted to try and approach it from a different perspective, bring you some, I've done quite a bit of miles in the car, I've done a few long journeys and I've tried to use it as much as possible and I've experimented with how much luggage goes in the boot. And I hope that's been useful, but to convey how this car makes you feel when you drive it is so difficult. Try and get to drive one if you can. They're sensational things. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed that one. If you have done so, please give me a thumbs up. Comments below are always welcome. And if you haven't done so already, please subscribe to Petroped for plenty more content to come. And I'll see you in the next film, guys, but you take care. Drive safe.